Obviously, the, the reason I turned professional was from a financial point of view. Um, I think everybody has to secure themselves for life, and this was an opportunity for me to secure myself for life. I decided that because rugby league in those days was uh, don't touch me, you know. If you were a rugby league player in those days, you were barred from everything. You know, I mean, uh, you weren't part of the social thing, uh, not only rugby, but the, the, the social everything. People just sort of shunned you, you know. You were a professional player. In 1895, rugby football split in two. Out of fear of losing control of the game to the working classes, the rugby football union banned the payment of players. Over the next 100 years, any player who took money to play professional rugby league was banned from playing amateur rugby union. It was very difficult to be living in Club Road very much a working class area. Your father was a miner, your grandfather was a miner, your bo bo both grandfathers were miners. And, you know, one of the great things about it, they, they, they weren't happy for us to go on the ground. They were trying to look for something better. Because Basically, it's my Welsh youth cap when I, I, I played for Wales as a youth and under 18. And my first experience was going to France and that was just incredible. I'd never been abroad before. And here I was going to France to play in an international rugby match, uh, albeit the youth team. We lost 36-0, but because the press wasn't uh, quite as eager as it is today, I came back home and tried to convince everybody that it was just a 6-3 a loss that we'd had and it wasn't as bad as everybody thought it might have been. We were up at home and uh, an old Mark 10 Jaguar, the old type Mark 10 Jaguars came down Club Row. Everybody bar men was out on their doors, you know, thinking, gosh, who were these people? And it was three gentlemen from St. Helens Rugby League Club. If, if people knew that they were rugby league people, gosh, I mean, it ruined all your chances you thought of ever playing for, for Wales as a rugby player. Joe Pickervance, who, who was the, the secretary of St. Helens Rugby League Club, came into the room and, and, and my father was saying, oh, my boy's going to play for Wales one day. He'll be an international rugby player. And yeah. Joe Pickervance said, well, rugby league's yeah. a game. We'll move him to the north of England and we'll get him out of the confines of family life down here. He, not only that, uh, we are prepared to give him uh, the open of this case and inside was £5,000 in money. And my father looked at it, looked at me, looked at the three gentlemen up north and said, where do we sign? We'll all come. <laughs> and that was my father's. And my mother was saying, no, Jack, he's too young, he's too young, he's too young. He can't go away on his own. But my father had never seen so much or heard of so much money in all his life, you know, as a minor. Of course, I denied and wouldn't play. And then I had the opportunity to go down and play for Newport. I mean, it was, it was the most exciting, it was the biggest game of all. <laughs> to have 28,000 or whatever it was here on that particular day, you just wouldn't believe. Uh, people. And, uh, and it was something extra special, really, and uh, an opportunity to play against um, players of the world now. To come down here as we did on that Wednesday afternoon, uh, to play the All Blacks, and you go into the ground and you made sure you're over, over here early enough and it was quite incredible actually seeing the people swarming in uh, even from work in afternoons who've taken time off to come and uh, it was just a mass of people and you, you knew when you came out from running at the top end of the ground and running out onto the pitch here to play against the mighty All Blacks was something quite a, outstanding, something I never dreamed of I suppose as a youngster. Brother to Watkins and here goes Watkins on the outside break. Out to Stuart Watkins. And here's danger for the All Blacks. Lahore covering for the All Blacks right in front of their posts. Now Newport want the heel. Can they get it? They can. Crosser. Azul trying to drop goal. 
And that one drop goal that John Hazel did. I mean, and suddenly we all jumped in the air because it went over the post and we were 3-0 up against the All Blacks. I can honestly say, hand on heart, that I went to watch a lot of other games in Wales as well, hoping that they didn't win. <laughs> hoping that the side that they were playing, the Aberavans and the Swansea's, uh, didn't win because we would then be the only side that uh, beat the All Blacks. Me at my house in Six Club Row, cleaning my boots for my very first international. So you can see how excited I am then. I always remember walking across to the ground, getting to the main gate at Cardiff, and he said, where's your ticket? Uh, the gate man, I said, well, I'm playing this afternoon, um, to which he didn't believe me at all. And it took some convincing of people then and others for him to let me in. So I can imagine my very first cap for Wales and not turning up because the gate man wouldn't let me into the ground to play against uh, at England at the Arms Park in Cardiff. But it was a momentous occasion, and then uh, being presented with your cap as you did after the game, uh, which is quite incredible, it was a prized possession. To play for Wales and, and to be an international rugby player, being watched by nearly 60,000 people, was something you just couldn't have uh, envisaged as a youngster, and uh, here I was doing it. Well, Campbell Hamilton was the tour captain. It was a massive job being captain of the Lions at that particular time. When you're on a five-month tour, as it was to New Zealand, Australia, and Canada. The sad part about it was it, it, it brought him down really and, and became too much for him and uh, made it rather difficult for him and uh, one of the, the only good thing out of it as far as I was concerned was the fact that he dropped himself in the second test in New Zealand and made me captain. You had a Welsh youth cap, you, you, you played for Wales, uh, you played for the Barbarians and here you were a captain of the British Lions, you know, I mean, significantly, in a, not in a provincial game, which I was in a couple of provincials, but I mean, to be captain in, of, of the Lions in a test match uh, against the All Blacks uh, at Wellington was, was, was quite incredible. Because of the conditions and everything there, we had to go out on the runway on the airport to, to, to do our training. Uh, somebody would shout, the plane's coming, and, and all of a sudden, 30 players would be running off the pitch at the same time, <laughs> in case the plane came down and hit us all over. Colin Mead tackled me, and I said, who the hell do you think you are, type of thing, of words to that effect, and stood up to him. And he just swung a haymaker and, and just laid me out. He always says it was uh, accidental, but uh, he he has uh, apologised and the thing as well. But And I shouldn't have made a fuss about it as well, because rugby is very confrontational. It always has been. There's always been a little bit of it. And, and uh, yeah, whilst I was laid out, which didn't help my cause, I don't suppose really, but I was five or six and he he was uh, six foot four and sixteen and a half so on. And... Uh, uh, the quite funny thing after was because the press made a hell of a long story about it. You know why on earth did Meads at six foot six, six foot four, and sixteen and a half stone hit little Di Watkins five foot six, ten and a half stone? And the Meads was being interviewed and said, "Let me tell you this," he said, "It was self defence, <laughs> bloody self defence." He said. <laughs> Me is every time I'd gone to an international match, 18 consecutive caps on the trot, coming back off the Lions to as captain, you're one of the most significant players in the dress room because everybody, well, they didn't look up to me because I was only five or six, but they, they looked to you as, a, as an individual, as a, as, as a player. And uh, you, you were just left out of it. And there is nothing worse than travelling as a reserve. And, and Barry was playing well, but Barry didn't play particularly well in Scotland and Wales lost. And suddenly, you know, which was a little farcical in a way then, from not being good enough to play for Wales on the one Saturday, I was brought back into Captain Wales uh, against Ireland in, in Dublin, you know. And uh, it, 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 it was just incredible that uh, you should be in that position. Watkins was made another offer from Rugby League, only this time it was too good to turn down. He was banned from playing Rugby Union when he joined Salford for a record fee. For leaving the Valleys and joining Salford Rugby League Club, David Watkins of Newport and Wales pocketed £13,000 tax-free. I, I went up uh, with Jane, who was my girlfriend at the time then. Uh, I'd been my wife for over 40-odd years now. And we went up to Manchester and um, had the money, bought a house for cash, you know. Who, who would ever do that in those days, I suppose, really? We went out onto the field, 19,000 people at, at Salford, packed to the ground, 
Most of them had come to see me fail, the rugby league people in particular, and then to say, why on earth have you paid all this money for a five or six midget from South Wales, you know? So, and to score the 70 yard try in my first game was the best thing that ever happened to me, quite frankly. They weren't all like that. I had many bad games from then on in. I always remember one game, and I missed, uh, got, went into one tackle and got pushed off into another tackle, pushed off until suddenly one exasperated wag in the crowd does it. For goodness sake, Watkins, hit him with your bloody wallet. <laughs> So, so biased was it at the time, I, I got hit after the ball had gone, you know, and I said, well, God's sake, Rev, you must have seen that happen. And he said, hey, don't ask me to look after you, look after yourself, you've been paid enough. And, and that was significantly what everybody thought at that particular time. The money became the most important factor of your rugby career. Once you've once you gone north, you really put your cross on the door and burnt it. You were now a rugby league player, you were a professional, you were being paid for what you were doing. You'd gone to the north of England, you moved away and you, you, you did what you wanted to do. And uh, that wasn't acceptable to the people down here in South Wales. If I could hear Dad, he would no doubt tell everybody uh, who I was associating with. And you could come home and say to people, oh, I sat with George, we had a meal together, you know. A, a, a minor which would be one of two or three hundred had worked at a colliery. He, he was the guy that they would sit in the tea room asking him questions about Man United to Man City. Like Rugby gave you an opportunity to A, to meet people, um, B, to travel, which you couldn't have afforded to have travelled the extent of the travelling that I have done and to have the good times I've had. To, 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 to have a wife like Jane who was bringing up two children while I was still enjoying myself playing rugby and going off on the tours and you have to be very grateful for that and we've been together for that right the way through it and her family and my family have been so supportive so at the end of the day it's like everything else in life if you don't have that support uh, from all those people at the same time it can make life pretty precarious to have a sporting career. So rugby has given me something that uh, that uh, I, I've got to be so grateful for in life, quite frankly. Uh, there I was, a, a valley boy, a working class background, and having an opportunity of doing far more, and having the opportunity to do everything you wanted to do in your life. And uh, when you sit back and think about it, it, it really does give you a, a sense of how lucky have I been. And I have been extremely lucky, I suppose, really. In 1995, 100 years after rugby's great divide, rugby union turned professional. Union players who had gone north to play rugby league were welcomed back and no longer under ban. Today David Watkins is on the board of Newport Gwent Dragons Rugby Union and the Celtic Crusaders Rugby League.